Welcome to a new episode of The Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker in New York. It is incredibly snowy. It is very, very, very cold. And I, I don't know where you guys are in the world right now, but I'm just hoping that you can hunker down and, you know, curl up in front of a fire, pour yourself a cocktail and enjoy the evening with me and a drink and, you know, perhaps even get a little relaxed so we can have a good night's sleep because we don't sleep on Shaken and Stirred, do we? No, we don't. I get you energized, I get you worked up. We have a cocktail, we have a laugh, we have a giggle. But today I've got someone rather special because he is in fact an expert when it comes to putting people to sleep. But that's not going to happen on this podcast because He's all about energizing people at the moment. That is right. Our guest today, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit about him, shall I? He has created, a, written a book called Energize that I have here in front of me, along with Stacey Griffith from Soul Cycle. She's one of the founding instructors and the author. And here it is in my hands um, for all of you who are watching it, because you can, don't forget, you can see this podcast also on YouTube. But if you're listening to it, you're going to have to go out and get the book. You can't miss it. It look, basically looks like a sort of solar, the sun has blown up on the front cover of this book with Energize written on it. Um, he is a double board certified clinical psychologist, leading sleep expert and author, known worldwide as the sleep doctor. Please welcome Dr. Michael Bruce. Dr. Michael Bruce. Dr. Bruce, how are you, mate? I am wonderful, Nigel. Thank you for having me back uh, on the show. Always good to have a cocktail with you, my friend. Always good to do that. And Not thanks bad. for, uh, we'll be talking about the book today, having some fun and uh, learning more about sleep, my favorite topic. Your, your favorite topic, one of my favorite things to do when I can, and this is that's why I'm actually really excited to talk to you about it because I, I actually suffer from you know not sleeping too well. But before we get there, what are you drinking? Ah, the question of the hour. So here in my mug, which I received for the holidays from my daughter, I'm pretty sure, I have something called banana tea. Ah. Ah, so what is banana tea and why am I drinking it? So magnesium turns out to be one of the minerals that is incredibly important for helping us calm down and relax before bed. Now, many people have a tendency to drink a, a chamomile tea, for example, or a lavender tea, for example. I drink chamomile tea. Exactly. Well, while that does have some data behind it in helping people feel, start, begin to feel sleepy and fall asleep, it turns out that magnesium is actually far more potent. Now, to be fair, there's not a lot of magnesium out there. Um, uh, it's, we have to eat our magnesium, in fact. We, it, our bodies don't produce it. So we have to find sources of magnesium that are really, really good. Quite frankly, dude, you could eat a bushel of kale and still not get the amount of magnesium that you need. But bananas turn out to be loaded with magnesium. However, it's not the fruit, it's the peel of oh. the banana, okay? So here's the recipe, is you take one banana, like so, you cut off the tip and the stem, cut it in half so that you have the fruit in it and the peel still on it. Wash it off to get any dirt or pesticides or anything like that on it. And then you take the banana and you drop it into some boiling water for four minutes or until the banana itself turns brown. Then you get this beautiful banana rich concoction. You can see it here. I hopefully don't spill this on my computer, um, but it is all it is is a boiled banana and it's banana water. Um, and it is loaded with magnesium. The peel has three times the amount of magnesium as the fruit itself. So one cup of this, about six ounces or so, you can give it to kids, you can give it to seniors. It has no interaction effects, doesn't affect medications. It's a perfect solution. And can you add bourbon to it? Yes, you can. So I have done this, in fact, I have created what I call, uh, well, I don't have a good name for it. Maybe we'll come up with a name for it at the end. I just call it my, uh, my banana bourbon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A little banana so, bourbon, which by the way, there are some banana um, liqueurs out there, which you yes, can Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Unfortunately, they don't really have much magnesium. I've explored that option and it doesn't seem to exist. So best if you have banana, uh, your banana tea, and then you add a little bit of bourbon with it. Well, you know, I actually take magnesium before going to bed. I get, I have chewables and I don't, that's a recent thing, but actually the banana tea, I would love to do, and I'm going to experiment with that. In fact, right after this, but what I'm doing right now, because, you know, I, I like to have a little cocktail on the Shaken and Stirred show. And in an honor of, uh, you know, 
the, the sleep doctor on the show, I thought I would do something which is a sort of classic nightcap, certainly for me. It's one of the most classic cocktails. It's a Manhattan, which- so That is my personal cocktail that I order every single time. It's really funny. I order a, a Basil Hayden Manhattan on the rocks every time. Fantastic. And what, what is the, uh, the Basil Maiden? Basil Hayden is the type of bourbon. It's a special Kentucky bourbon uh, that I absolutely love. Not had that one before. Basil Hayden. I will have to get some of that. Well, that's fantastic. So this actually is a ransom bourbon, uh, a Ooh. rye ransom bourbon, which is yeah. fantastic as well from Sheridan in Utah. Um, and it is, it's, for all of you out there, it is two parts uh, bourbon to one part. Uh, actually, with me, I like to change it up. So you can use wow. a, a sweet vermouth, you know, a, a rosso or whatever, but I do half and half. I do half dry, half sweet, because I'm not as sweet as I like. And I then added... Uh, orange bitters as well as yes. the angostura bitters right because i think oh. the orange just picks it up and then it has a maraschino cherry in there uh, as it would make a classic and it's stirred over ice to make it a classic do not shake this people no and um here we go cheers my friend absolutely cheers to you my friend delicious mm. So while you are having a banana tea, um, which will hopefully not put you to sleep on this, because I know I know with you that you have enough energy for both of us anyway, <laughs> uh, which is, well, I guess, what, what the name of your book is, Energized, because you have ma many books. I've got your other book here, which I, this is how I first met you. It's called The Power of When. Yep. And if everyone out there, if you haven't read The Power of When, it's a brilliant book. I mean, it, it's, it was, it's, a, it's a bestseller and it really, this sort of helps you break down what type of person you are. We're going to get into this too, because Dr. Bruce has a thing he calls a chronotype. Yep. And it, it, it sort of tells you by discovering what kind of chronotype you are, when to do things, the power exactly. of when, when to eat, when to drink, when to exercise, when to take your meds, when to even have sex and other things, people. We're going yep. to get to it all. <laughs> You've also come out with a book called Energize, which for a sleep doctor seems to be the right. sort of opposite of what I would expect. So. First of all, just give us a, a quick synopsis of, before we jump into it of, of why Energize. So, so I'll tell you the story and, uh, and I appreciate you asking. So one of the things that has gone on in my life is I wrote the book, The Power of When, and we started to learn about these chronotypes. Now, for folks out there who may not have heard of the term chronotype, you've actually heard of it before. If anybody out there has ever been called an early bird or a night owl, those are chronotypes, specifically sleep chronotypes. My contribution to the literature was I added two others. Um, and we changed the names. And so an early bird is now a lion. Somebody in the middle is a bear. A night owl is a wolf. And somebody who has problems sleeping is a dolphin. We'll get into all of that in just a moment. If you want to learn your chronotype, go to chronoquiz.com. Once I did that, I started really thinking about when to do things during the day, when to eat, when to exercise, when to sleep. And I was working with my friend, Stacy Griffith. Now, Stacy is one of the uh, original founding trainers of Soul Cycle. That's Love the it. indoor bicycle thing. Um, and we were talking about our clients. And she said, Michael, some of my clients work out once, even twice with me, and they're exhausted. I'm like, how well are they sleeping? And she, I said to her, you know, now that you mention it, some of my clients talk to me after they've gotten a full six, seven, eight hours of sleep, and they tell me that they're exhausted. She said, do they exercise? And I said, you know, that's a good question. And then we both went, aha. <laughs> we, we need to be asking each other's questions to our own patients. And we said, we should write a book or something to show what the relationships are here. So then I started digging a little deeper and I said, all right, Stacy, how do you determine which exercises that you give to people? Because people might fail. They might do like one. They might not like another, that sort of thing. And she said, oh, I do it based on their body. I was like, what do you mean? She said, well, when my people are tall and small and lean, I have certain like more cardio exercises. When I've got somebody who's a little stocky or a little thicker, I might do more like weightlifting anaerobic exercise. And I said, oh, so, so you base it on body type? She looked at me and she was like, you mean the body type from back in high school, right? So if you go back in high school, we all learned in biology class about endomorph, mesomorph, and ectomorph. And these were three distinct body types. So here's the interesting thing, Nigel, is chronotypes are genetic. It's not, it's not a theory that I made up. I can actually look on the human genome and show you exactly where your chronotype is. Mm -hmm. You can do the same with body type. So now we have two fundamental genetically tied markers from which to work. So I said, okay, I wonder if this body type is different for different chronotypes. So look, I've had a million and a half people take the quiz. So we, we posted something, a survey monkey. 
Right, I know, right? And said, hey, do us a favor, tell us your body type. And we gave people a secondary quiz. We got 5,000 people to fill it out within the first few days. And here's what we learned. Certain chronotypes are associated with certain body types. So as an example, if you're a long and lean person, you may have a tendency to be an early bird. If you're a little bit on the bigger side, you may have a tendency to be a night owl. Why that information becomes important is because it also teaches us a whole lot about your movement as well as your eating. So metabolism is really what's going on with that body type thing. So once we figured out how to move your metabolism and your body type together, everything got really interesting really quickly. So we added a component of intermittent fasting. So for folks out there who may not know what that is, I know you know what that started, is. I've started doing it myself. I know, I know. So here's what's cool about intermittent fasting. We call it time-restricted eating, or you only eat during a window, what we call your feeding time. Here's what's interesting. I've been an intermittent faster for five years, but I intermittent fast based on my chronotype schedule. And I am a night owl or what's called a wolf. So mm. Like it's right now, it's about two o'clock here in the afternoon. I just had my first meal of the day because I'm a night owl. So I will eat, I'll have my feeding period will be now until just about three hours before I go to sleep. So we are able to move those around again, based on body type. So we started to learn a whole host of different things. Many people don't even know when to fast or for how long to fast. And so we were able to figure that out as well. No, and that's a great question because I mean I think that you know when I think about it you know I have been doing this intermittent fasting myself and I'll stop eating probably two hours before I go to bed it should probably be three but I think realistically it's closer to two hours sometimes one and a half hours just because <laughs> you have some kind of something or you just you know I'm also busy until I so by the time I get to eat my dinner it is on the later side and I wish I could get it done earlier but with my kids schedules kids you know everyone lives active lives and right. they've got sports they've got homework they've got this that and everything else by the time I get to home it's sort of eight o'clock eating at eight o'clock which is late right and then I need to go to bed by sort of 10 30 11 because I get up every day between five and six right so you know but I, I'm when I'm thinking about when I'm intermittent fasting is you know is that okay then for me and I did your quiz and I came out as a bear Right. Perfect. So I'd rather uh, be a bear than anything. Really? Is that, is that true? And why is yeah, that? Bear's the best because bear functions on a daily schedule that everybody else functions on. There's more bears than anybody else. Right. And so what's cool about that is the nine to five work week is one that would actually work well with you. Now you have a tendency to be a little bit on the later side, as well as get up a little bit on the earlier side than most bears do, but that's okay. Um, I still think you fit well within that category. The question then becomes, when do you intermittent fast? Right. And for how long do you intermittent fast? So we can figure out what your body type is actually quickly in front of everybody if you'd like. Sure. If people take their thumb and their right next to your ring finger and you put it around your wrist like yeah. this. Yeah. If, you can, if your fingers overlap, then you're an ectomorph. If they touch, you're a mesomorph and they, they just barely touch, or don't touch, then you're an endomorph. So what I have barely, you got? Barely touch. So you are a mesomorph like me. So you're a, more of an athletic build. Your shoulders are farther out than your waist and you kind of hang neat on the scale in more of a V shape, which means you have a medium metabolism. So here's where this gets interesting. So if you're a bear with a medium metabolism, you're right smack dab in the average of everybody, which is perfect because more good stuff happens for those people than anybody. So the question becomes, Michael, time I'll let you get away with calling me average, Michael, but anyway, we'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> for one thing is for sure, Nigel, you are the least close to average of any person I think I've known on the face of this earth. But in this one <laughs> instance, some of your genetics are helping us out in a positive way. So now because you're a mesomorph, here's what we know. We know the length of your feeding schedule needs to be 10 hours and the length of your fasting schedule needs to be 14 hours. If you were a little bit on the thicker side and an endomorph, then I would say that it should your feeding should be only eight hours, whereas your fasting should be 16 hours because those people have a tendency to want to lose a decent amount of weight. For you, you might turn to me and say, Michael, I don't necessarily want to lose any weight, but I want to maybe trim things down or lean things out. That's what intermittent fasting will do for that. If you were an ectomorph, long and lean, then we would have you uh, actually, uh, it would be a 12 and 12. You would feed for 12 and you would fast for 12 because again we don't want those people to lose any weight then of course you would do it based on your chronotype 
Right. No, absolutely. Well, I do want to lose some weight, certainly this time of the year as well. Um, after it is like, hard this holiday. time of year. I agree with you, brother. Well, you know, it, it's, it's just, you know, talking about getting the energy, you know, and I think this is what your book's about, energizing and getting people, you know, really up and, and moving when it is freezing and it is cold and yes, you, yes. you don't have the you know, motivation to go outside or run or jog or you're just... And, you know, and, and unfortunately, because we are living in a pandemic, the fact of the matter is, is so many people aren't going to a gym in the same way. So they are yeah. stuck exercising online and stuff. And so that can also be difficult if they don't have the motivation, they don't have the, the you know, the, someone pushing them, the trainer or their workout group or whatever. You know, so certainly, I guess, to, to, tell us, you know, for, for those mm -hmm. sorts of, for, for people in general right now, what can they, what do they expect to get out of this book? If they're going to pick this book up, Energize, it says, yeah, yeah. go from dragging ass to kicking it in 30 days. 30 days, that's not 30 long. days, guaranteed, no problem. So here's how, so, so I want to segue based on what you were just talking about, which was exercising and how with the pandemic, in many cases, people are not going to gyms. They're not going outside because of the weather. Right. things of that nature. I mean, you're in New York. The, I think you guys just got a big snowstorm wander through Nine there. Nine inches. Oh my word. I'm thankfully you're safe and dry and, and warm. Um, but here's the thing. We have a movement schedule, not an exercise schedule, but a mm. movement schedule. And I want to explain what that is and why we have it in there. So remember, sitting is the new smoking, right? We don't like to be stable. We don't need to be, you know, standard. We want to be moving around. We want our bodies to move. Because of the weather and because of the pandemic, a lot of people have been sheltered in place, not been able to do that. So we came up with a schedule five different times throughout the day for five minutes. So I'm not talking, you're not breaking a sweat here. This is not exercise. This is a movement schedule. Now, you might be asking, okay, why would we need something like this? So if we're sitting and we're stagnant in our blood pools, we begin to relax and our parasympathetic nervous system starts to kick in and say, oh, you're sitting down. Oh, you're relaxing. Maybe, maybe we need to be going to sleep right now as opposed to every couple of hours moving, then your body knows it's supposed to stay in motion. So these five uh, times are very specific. So one is right after you wake up, one is just before lunch, the other is after lunch, before dinner, and just before bed. Five different times, five different movements. The first movement is what we call a stretch. Kind of makes sense, right? You've been asleep for six, seven, eight hours, you know, eh, 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 kind of get the joints going again, right? I do it when I'm brushing my teeth, believe it or not. Um, the second one is what we call a shake. So where you shake your arms or you shake your legs. So I don't know, Nigel, if you have any dogs. Um, we have two. I do. You do? So we have two French bulldogs. And when they're lying on the ground sleeping and then they get up, the first thing they do is like, uh, they do that crazy shake thing. You know what yeah, I'm talking sure. about? it wakes them up, right? I mean, I just did it and I feel more alert, right? And so right. that shake is a way to take the blood that's pooling in your torso and bring it out distally to again, alert your body and give you some movement capabilities and a little bit more movement. The third one is called a bounce. So literally you're just hopping up and down. Many, maybe you've got one of those little mini tramps from back in the eighties that nobody uses anymore, right? You know what I'm talking about, bro. I know, you know what you're what talking about, but I don't have one, but I do know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about though, right? Or jumping jacks, again, not to break a sweat, just to cause some blood flow and some movement. The fourth one is you do use a major muscle group. We call this one build. So it could be push up. It could be sit-ups, it could be deep knee bends. Again, not to break a sweat, but more to just get the body to keep moving because the more you stay stable, the more things seem to lock down and it's just not good for you. Lowers heart rate variability, which we know is an overall marker of good health. The final one is a balance. And this is just before bed. Maybe it's a tree pose, maybe it's a yoga thing, but it's something to help you relax, focus, and not think about anything else five times throughout the day, you just do it on your phone. We actually give you times on your phone to set an alarm and then the alarm goes off. And you know exactly what to do. That's fantastic. I mean, look, I've, as you know, um, talked to a lot of different top experts in fitness and, and in wellness in general. And there's Constantly. one thing that they all say it's, it's about movement. It doesn't matter what exercise you're doing. It doesn't matter what kind of sport you're doing. It's about moving your body. And yeah. I think that we are sort of, a, you know, we've become very sedentary in, in the way that we just in front of computers and zooming and, huh. you know, and it, there's, it's, it's sort of slightly scary because before you know it, 
when you look back at what you've done that day, you realize that your body you've eaten, because that's the yeah. one thing you don't forget to do is sort of like, right. oh, let me eat. And then you just go back to sitting. And, you know, obviously, then you're upset by the way you look, but it's not so much. It's really the fact that you just needed to get your body up and around and moving. And, you know, I, I like to do a constitutional no matter what and go for a walk with the dogs. Perfect. So take them out just to kind of go and get that body moving and, and what have you. And, you know, now, do you do that in the morning or do you do that in the afternoon or in the evening? Well, I, I like to do it in the morning, but it's occasionally I'll do it in the afternoon, you know, so. So what I was going to say is I have a very specific morning routine and I, it includes my dogs as well. And I wanted to make a note to people out there is there's nothing better than unconditional love in the morning, right? So when, when you wake up, your partner may not be thrilled with you for something that you said or did, but your dog loves you. And spending a good three to five minutes just appreciating having that creature in your life instantly changes your energetic profile. You're, you're happy. You're having fun. You're hanging out with your dog. You love it, right? I do the same thing. I've got two, two bulldogs. I love that. How many dogs have you got? I normally wake up in the, in, the, in the morning and I'm kind of pissed off with my dog because my dog has a tendency to get in between my wife and me. <laughs> and my wife, I think, prefers my dog to me. So she's a separate issue. the dog. And I'm looking at the dog and going, Memphis, piss off. You know, and, and meanwhile, he looks at me and he's like, you know, <laughs> and then now it's too cold. He doesn't want to come out for a walk with me. But, you know, uh, I opened a gym called the Dog Pound and I've got one in New York and one yes, in LA. Yes, I heard Looking about that. Hugh Jackman. And, you know, that was created. Hugh used to bring his dog, Dali, and I brought Memphis to the gym with us. And we used to tie him up in the gym and we used to work out at five o'clock in the morning when he was training to be Wolverine. And yep. it was that moment that we nicknamed ourselves the Dog Pound. So the whole dog pound gym and that whole thing was based on our love of our dogs, taking them with us to work out right. early in the morning, get the blood going so we could kick off the day knowing we'd had a good hour solid slog with our dogs there witnessing it all. Um, and so, Perfect. yes, I'm fully with you on that. Yeah. So I had forgotten that you opened that gym, the dog pound. That's right. What a, I mean, what a perfect segue into that. You know, it makes perfect sense. And so morning routines turn out to be a big deal because remember, we start thinking, we need to start thinking about our sleep right as we wake up, because what we do during that daytime will certainly set us up for either a good night or a really crappy night, depending upon caffeine intake, how much alcohol, when, cannabis, what, whatever your thing is, so what's exercise, your thing about stress, morning versus anxiety. evening, Dr. Bruce, you know, what's, that? what's your thing about morning versus evening? Because I know that you, you have a theory on this. And I, I'm always been a morning workout person. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean I don't work out in the afternoons. And sometimes right. I you know, because occasionally you have to because you, you missed your morning workout. Right. And I and I often surprise myself by working out incredibly well in the afternoon. And I'm like, wow, like, I should do this more often then I do it again. And it's like, not so good. And I'm like, huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so know. This is exactly what happens to a bear, which is who you are. So we now, we did actually a little bit of a study on bears and exercise. And what we discovered is if bears don't exercise before noon, they're almost never going to do it. But if they do, they get a great response, but it doesn't usually last very long. So you literally described the entire thing that we learned about the chronotype in which you are that has to do with exercises. Generally speaking, if we can get those folks to exercise in the morning time, they'll do it. But after about 12 o'clock, forget about it. Yeah, no, that's that's literally me to a T. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's bonkers. So how funny is that? I mean, it's 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 so but it's, so, it's, it's, so for everyone else out there, you just have to figure out your chronotype and then figure out whether you're a morning or an evening person. That's correct. So if people want to figure that out, you go to chronoquiz. Dot com. That's my website. Takes you about two minutes and you'll learn more than you ever wanted to know. And by the way, I'll send you results to teach you what time to go to bed, what time to wake up, when to drink caffeine and when to drink alcohol. He's not bossy at all. Um, so I want to get on to uh, this, you know, the, the whole, you know, a little bit into more into the body type thing, because, yep. you know, we have these chronotypes, but, you know, I'm, there's me. I'm, I'm already just itching because I've been kind of labeled as something. And <laughs> is it possible to change? Can Great you question. So people ask me all the time, is it possible to change your chronotype? And yeah. is it possible to change your body type? So the answer is no, it's genetics. Okay. <laughs> right. Be, I mean, your genes are your genes. Like you can't change your genes unless you go get one of those CRISPR oh, things. And, and maybe... old dog new tricks basically is what you're trying right, to say. Right. But knowing your genetics 
is a real advantage because you can really leverage that, right? So as a bear, you know that there are certain times of day that you're going to do things better than others. So you can schedule it that way in order to do it. Now, you have a pretty crazy schedule, I have to admit. I mean, you're up early, you're out late, and you work all the time doing all kinds of things. And so your energy level has to be pretty consistent. So it makes intuitive sense to me that you're an intermittent faster because we know intermittent fasting when you're not eating and in that stage of what's called autophagy, where your body is just burning fat, it's the highest energetic state that you mm. can get. The one thing though that we haven't talked about is stress or emotional energy. Now, I have, I have to tell you, Nigel, you have the most stress, one of the most stressful jobs in the universe because you deal or used to deal with quite frequently all of those crazy supermodels. Yes. And that had to be one of the most stressful things. I'm sure no one out there is feeling sorry for me right now, by the way. I, I can no, appreciate No that. one feels sorry for the person dealing with supermodels. Like when I got back to my wife and said, so, you know, so-and-so gave me a hard time. She was being real diva, blah, blah, blah. You know, right. th my wife is not looking at me going, oh, honey, look, let me massage your feet. Right, Trust exactly. Me, that ain't happening. But it is a highly emotionally stressful situation. And one of the points of the book is we talk about something called emotional energy and how we have highs and emotional lows and how to deal with some of those. And so I thought I would do a little bit of stuff on emotional energy for folks just so they could help identify it. I would love to know. Some of I've got to say, Dr. Moose, my biggest issue, and I think it is emotion, my emotional stress, Yep. I, that if I'm if there's one thing that wakes me up at night or keeps me awake at night, rather, because sure. I will I seem to wake up naturally and we can talk, I want to love to talk about this as well, like why we wake up, because I, I wake up at around three thirty in the morning clockwork. You know, I can tell I, you exactly why you wake up at three thirty. And, and I, let's get into it. But it, it's sort of I wake up and then I stay awake because all of a sudden the emotional MC in my head starts to tell me about all these random things and makes me feel guilty and this, that and everything else. And I'm sitting there going. Can you shut up? Can you just be quiet? I, I just want to go to sleep and I'm, I haven't done anything. I'm like, is this the same shit that was going on in the day? But you don't bother me in the day. You only bother me at 3.30 in the morning. So okay, going I'm going to tell you what's going on. So the most popular time in the night to wake up is between 2.30 and 3.30 in the morning. So when you're falling asleep, your core body temperature rises, rises, rises till about 10.30. Then it hits a peak and then it begins to drop. That drop signals your brain to release melatonin and starts the sleep process. This is why we don't exercise too close to bedtime because then our core body temperature won't drop. It continues to drop, drop, drop until about 2.30 in the morning where it starts to rise back up again in order to wake us up. Therefore, our, the depth of our sleep changes between 2.30 and 3.30 to a lighter sleep. So it's much more easy to wake up Almost everybody wakes up at that period of time. However, most people turn over and fall right back to sleep. This is where that emotional energy can certainly come into play. Or even there are times during the daytime where you may have emotional energy that's at highs or at lows. And let's figure out how to deal with some of those things. So when you're thinking about this idea of emotional energy, I, I label it as an emo these people that come into my life that are emotional vampires okay they walk in and they suck the life right out of you you know who i'm talking about hell yeah right these are people that just require so much they're they're burdensome or they may be a dear friend that's going through a tough time and is requiring a lot of your time and your energy that's okay too we want to be there for our friends but we have to be able to protect ourselves emotionally otherwise we're up at 3 30 in the morning pissed off and not able to return to sleep. Right. So when we have these emotional times during the daytime where we know, oh, this person's gonna suck it all out of me, what can we do? What are some solutions? Believe it or not, there's some very easy, straightforward solutions. So one of my favorites, my son taught me, music. So what I do is I keep a playlist on my phone. When you're driving in your car or you're on the, on the train or whatever and your favorite song comes on, what do you do? You start bopping around, right? Yeah. You dig it. You're into it. You're singing along. Imme immediate emotional energy change. Instant, right? So my son is terrible at waking up in the mornings. So here's what we decided to do. Of course, he's a teenager, so go figure. Yeah. My so son's we, bad too. I want to know. So here's what we did is we said, you are the DJ of the morning times in the house. You can only play music. 
You have to start it exactly at 7 a.m. You get to choose whatever we're all going to listen to and you can put it at whatever volume you want. But if you sleep past it, you don't get the choice and your sister gets to be the DJ for the day and you have to listen to her music instead of yours. Then we would alternate days. Here's what ended up happening. He would be Johnny on the spot, 6.55, he'd be ready. And at seven o'clock, his favorite, by the way, he's kind of a throwback kid, was you have to fight for your right to party by the Beastie Boys every <laughs> morning at a volume of 10. But you know what? It changed the entire morning. Mornings used to suck at our house, dude. Like we'd be yelling and screaming like, get up. No, I don't want to. Now we're all bopping around, having a great time, dancing to the music. You see how we change the entire yeah. energetic profile by inserting an emotionally uplifting situation. My son's into Kanye, so I'm not sure that that's really what I want to listen to in the morning. But hey, you know, if he gets him out of bed, you know, maybe I right. can do it. I had to, I mean, look, I was fortunate. My son likes the Beastie Boys. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, throwback will do me fine. Let me, put on, let me put on some Led Zeppelin and get this party going. But Right, yeah. exactly. My son likes Kanye too. Don't feel too bad. Um, other different emotional uh, energy solutions that we can have are uh, laughter uh, is another good one. So again, using my son as an example, he, is, he loves comedy. He'll send me these little TikTok videos that are really, really funny. Now, number one, Getting something from my son immediately changes my perspective because it's my son and I love him and it's awesome to get, you know, stuff from him. The fact that he's even thinking about me during the day and wants to share something with me makes me feel good and changes me energetically. But then he sends me a really funny joke and I start cracking up again, immediately changes my energetic profile. So I got a whole bunch of these things sitting on here. So I, it's like a toolbox, right? Is Having these tool sets available to you that you know in your head can help you gain an energetic perspective. Now, let's say the other, let's say the opposite is true. Not somebody that sucks energy from you, but somebody that's so hyper that you feel like after you've dealt with them, you're like, uh, I felt yeah. right. I feel like I've drank four cups of coffee, right? Those are times where we need to energetically slow down, right? And so for those, we use things like breathing techniques. My favorite is one that I, I think I've shared with you before. It's called four, seven, eight breathing. So this is where you breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, and you breathe out for a count of eight. This is a, this is a technique that was developed by Dr. Andrew Weil. It's currently used by the Navy SEALs, and it helps almost immediately lower your heart rate, which slows everything down. So if you get into a situation with somebody and you're really aggression and knocking it out and you, you, you leave and you're like, oh, I feel like crap, four, seven, eight breathing is a great methodology to just slow your roll, then be able to get back energetically where you feel comfortable. And then that's what I use. You taught me that. And, I, and, I, and I've never forgotten it. And I, I find it very useful indeed. And I, I think it's one of those things for, for me, I'll find I'll wake up and I, I've realized now that it, you know, it's not one problem that I have, right? So you, you think like, oh, it's this one issue. And I, if I conquered this issue, then I'll be fine, right? Because reality is, is that I'll find another one and it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And it could be this, anything, everything and everything from really actual problems, the problem that not a problem at all, like something completely random to something minuscule that pissed me off or something that, and I'll just pick on it. And I'm like, why am I dealing with this at 3.30 in the morning? Like, this is absurd, right? So. I, you know, I, again, it's that, you know, I, one of the things I do is that breathing. But the other thing I do is picture my daughter who, mm -hmm. I, who is, you know, is just smiling and it just calms me down. It's like, boom, a, that's visual. perfect. That's that's a perfect emotional energizer right there because you're you were going in the in the negative emotional energy realm. And then it brings you back to the positive. Somebody that you care about. She's smiling. It brings a good feeling to you. That's perfect. It's a great example. Right. So, I mean, you know, there, there, it's, it's so funny because you spend, we, we, you know, so many of us spend, I think, inordinate amounts of time worrying, stressed, and there's so much stress in the world these days with everything that's going on without COVID. And I, and I, don't, and I don't wake up worried about COVID, but I have noticed that since COVID, I have been more stressed. And it's, yes. I'm more on edge and I don't know what, you know, and I think trying to figure out why, and then it's like the whole world is on edge. And I think, you know, I've done certain things, for example, I've cut caffeine out of my diet completely. I have right. zero caffeine um, in my diet. And I stopped that about six months ago. So it's been, I'm six months caffeine free. 
so what is the deal with caffeine you know how, how bad is it for people because i think i i feel much better for not yeah. having caffeine in my body yeah so i think actually we talked about that the last time we were together was caffeine consumption and how it works so let's give people some real statistics and understanding this so number one caffeine consumption just during covid which is in the last two to three years has gone up almost 18 percent per person. So if you're a caffeine drinker, you're drinking 18% more caffeine currently than you were before. So that's number one. The way caffeine works is interesting because it enters into the system. It takes about 25 to 30 minutes to kick in and then you feel the effects, but then cognitively, you don't feel the effects after about an hour and a half to two hours. However, it's still on board and it is still affecting your system. Mm -hmm. So what we call the half life of caffeine, which is when half of it has been um, digested and moved out of your system is approximately eight hours. Wow. Eight hours. So if you stop drinking caffeine at 2 p.m., 50% of it is still on board while you're trying to fall asleep at 10 p.m. So that's one. Yeah, another interesting statistic about caffeine is the quarter life, meaning when is 25% of the caffeine left in my system? That's 12 hours which is even more messed up. So if you have a cuppy at 10 o'clock in the morning, 25% of it is still on board at 10 o'clock at night. So you eliminating caffeine really opens up the system to, so that stimulation doesn't have that major of an effect. Now, one thing I do wanna say for your watchers and your listeners is do not go cold turkey off of caffeine if you are a large caffeine consumer, like more than three to four cups a day. I've had two patients, these were pot a day coffee drinkers, end up in the emergency room when they cold turkeyed off of caffeine. Right. So I want to be very clear to people, if you are a large coffee drinker or a caffeine drinker, Red Bull, whatever your pleasure, you need to slowly taper the caffeine. Otherwise, you're going to have a killer headache for sure. Um, I had one person have seizures. I'm not suggesting that that's something that would happen to everybody. They had a proclivity for seizures that we didn't know about. So that was something that we learned. But on the flip side of that, mm -hmm. the fact that caffeine can be so addictive that if you stop drinking it, it could give you a seizure. Think about it, people. Should you be drinking it? I mean, right. you know what I mean? It's like, there's something to be said for that in itself. I mean, absolutely. For all of you out there who are thinking, oh, I'm not going to give it up because, you know, I remember Hugh, Hugh Jackman and I, when we were doing the dog pump, we used to start, this is how we used to work out. We used to do a double shot of espresso before we worked out. And every day it was our, our ritual. We would double shot it at like 5 a.m. And it was someone's job. We would text each other right. you know, or someone you in the group. It up. You Who's going to pick it up, bring it to the gym? And we were all, before we worked out, it was 5.15 in the morning. We're coming in and it, we're passing out the double shots of espresso. And then we're going and hitting the gym and then working out like a fiend. But I found that, I, that still at sort of 10 o'clock at night that night, my yes. heart would be racing. Yes. And I would be like, why am I, why is my heart pounding in my chest? And why am I so worked up and wound up? And, you know, and, and I, I, I really didn't understand what was going on. And I spoke to my mother. Mm. who lo and behold said to me that her and my older brother stopped drinking coffee 20 years ago they oh. never told me they just stopped and, I, and they were like because we can't handle coffee and they were like and i'm like well, why didn't you tell me because i can't handle coffee either maybe right. and anyway so i you know worked my way off stopped drinking coffee then was drinking black tea stopped drinking black now i've stopped everything and i don't even have caffeine in if I see caffeine in anything, like a, a drink, a, a protein powder, anything at all, right. I don't go near. And I don't go near any of the substitutes, by the way, either. Things that are caffeine-like, because I don't want, and I think it's helped me a lot calm down. Because as you know, I'm, I sort of bounce off the walls anyway. I don't, I'm not someone who, I have very high energy anyway. Right. And one of the, so this is, this is a fascinating conversation. So one of the pieces of data that I was going to talk about, which you've already shown us with your own example, is people's brains change when they drink caffeine for extended periods of time. You mentioned that your mom and your brother had already figured out in their lives hey, caffeine doesn't work well for me. Believe it or not, some people don't have the right enzymes to be able to digest caffeine appropriately. So it either stays on longer or has almost no effect to them. As an example, my doctor, she has an espresso and goes to bed every night. And I'm like, Carrie, come on. I'm the sleep doctor. What are you doing? So we ran a study. It turns out her body doesn't process 
caffeine. So it, is it literally a cultural goes, thing? Is, I mean, I say cultural, but is it a, for where you are, like I say that because my wife is genetic. Chinese, right? And my wife is Chinese and she can drink right. coffee, it seems, but she yeah. can't drink alcohol. Like right. she has one glass of alcohol and it's enough. And if Done. she has more than one, she gets like a rash on her nose. She gets yeah. like, yeah. she goes, you know, it, it affects her really. And I'm like, oh, wow. And she's like, oh, it's a Chinese thing. She said, my father is like that. My relatives are like that. We find it hard to drink, process alcohol in the same way. And I have that same Irish idea. gene, but I'm also Sri Lankan. So I've got Irish and Sri Lankan. Oh. So I'm a bit of a mix myself. That's a great combination. So you can drink alcohol, but stay away from caffeine. Apparently, that's that's what, who I You're, am. Right? I, I'm say, I think we should go hang out on Friday nights. Right, Manhattan's <laughs> all around. I love it. Absolutely, yeah. The data is really interesting. They did MRI studies of people's brains who had been drinking caffeine, like let's say daily, for several years, and what they discovered was their brains couldn't function without caffeine over a longer period of time. So you probably saved yourself by stopping that caffeine, slowly tapering, and then being removed from it. Um, quite a bit. And here's the, here's my question to you, Nigel, is have you noticed that your energy is smoother now that you don't have caffeine on board? Oh, yeah. Everything is better. Right? Funny thing is, people, too, is that you you know, I went through about a month questioning, looking at where the coffee is. And, you know, even like, you know, my wife makes coffee and we have a very nice, expensive sort of Breville coffee maker and it smells <laughs> freaking amazing. It's oh, yeah. a whole freaking, you know, it's, a, it's a lava, the, the whole process, the making right. of it, the, the noise, the zhuzhing, the, you know, the <laughs> pouring and the, oh, I've got my coffee. And I'm like looking there sort of got nothing. And I'm like, shit, I want one of those, whatever it is. It just look at all the attention that that drink just produced. But right. having stopped it after a month now, I actually have zero, zero, zero. I mean, it's been six months, okay, or maybe a bit longer. Zero craving. I don't want to, and, and I, my, this is another interesting thing. I used to not really like herbal teas. Mm. I used to sort of pretend to like herbal teas. I would have them <laughs> and be like, I should be having a herbal tea. Oh, yes, I'll have a herbal tea. I'll have a chamomile. I'll do a Rui Bosch. I'll do whatever it might be. Right, whatever. Uh, you know, not really like it and be like always slightly pissed off that I hadn't actually got a proper tea or a proper coffee in front of me. Now, on the other hand, it's as if my entire taste buds have been woken That's it, right. and they're alive. And now I'm like, chamomile tea is tastes unbelievable. And I'm like, oh, the different types of chamomile tea. Let me brew it myself. Fresh banana tea, for goodness <laughs> sake. You yeah. name it. I'm going to drink it. I'm going to taste it. And it's right. going to have an effect on me. I want to own my body. I want to own my feelings. I want to own the way I feel. The way, if I, and I want to know if my body's telling me I'm tired, I don't want to give it a drug to say, no, you're going to wake up. Exactly. I want, to, I want my body to be telling me you should be asleep. You should be awake, right? So you're so you're like the poster child for Energize because that's exactly what it does is it listens to your body. So it listens to your genetics. You want to follow your genetics. What your body wants to do is what you want it to do. And that's exactly what Energize is about, where we take body type, chronotype, we give you intermittent fasting, movement, and sleep all wrapped together. It's it's exactly the methodology that you're describing. It's perfect. You, know, you, you get into everything on this book, and I, <laughs> I love it because you get into sleep, energy, body types, chronotypes, but you also get into sex and relationships. I I, yeah. And I think that this is something which, you know, I think I, I want to touch on it but more than touch on it because I think it's a really important part. You know, most of us are in some sort of relationship. Certainly, if you get to my age, 50, you know, you're in a relationship, you've got your kids, you've got your wife, you've got your, you know, everything. It's, it's a juggling act. And, right. you know, you say, but you also talk about your chronotypes talking to you about the right time to have sex. And the reason why I ask, I ask this is because if your partner is not the same chronotype as you, and she she has a different time for having sex. How do the two go together? Like I, I there's me the bear. She, my I wife you, is, a, is a night owl, you know, uh -huh. and I, and I, so I don't know, you know, whatever that might be called, dolphin or. And she wolf. goes, to, she sleeps pretty well, wolf. So then, how you know, how do, when, when are the two of us supposed to meet? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it all out for you. All right. So first of all, we did several different studies looking at when is the best time to have an intimate relationship with somebody, right? From a connection standpoint, from a physical standpoint, and from an endurance standpoint, right? So 
three different aspects that we all have when, we, when we're considering becoming intimate with somebody, right? So the first thing we did was we had to, um, we had to survey people and find out when is the most popular time for people to be having sex. Surprise, surprise, 1030 to 1130 at night is when 74% of people are having sex. Okay, that makes sense. The, the first question I asked on the male side of the equation was hormones. So we know that your hormone profile in order to have successful sex has to have five hormones that are elevated and one hormone that is depressed. Five hormones that need to be elevated are cortisol, adrenaline, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. The one that's supposed to be low is melatonin. I'll give you one guess, Nigel, as what your hormone profile looks like at 1130 at night, right? By the way, I, I don't remember the last time I had sex at 1130 at night. <laughs> that's another story. We'll get to that in a second. Melatonin is high and all those five others are low. So that's hint number one as to when people should be considering having successful sex. Hint number two, what do most men wake up with in the morning? An erection, morning wood, exactly, right? If that is not mother nature telling you when to use that damn thing, I don't know what is. Do me a favor, brush your teeth first, but then hop back in bed and see what happens. So you've heard it here. Nigel and I are giving everybody a prescription right now to tomorrow after you've heard this podcast, try having sex with your partner in the morning and see if you like it better because you might be surprised that you do. Now I wanna get into the whole idea of what if your chronotype is different than your partner's chronotype. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm very fortunate. My partner and I are both night owls. Um, we always have been. And so she doesn't seem that perfectly works perfectly well for her. But what happens if you're an early bird and you're married to a night owl, right? right. So, so just, I wanna, cause I wanna get right into what you're going on about. Here. Let's go brother. But so, so on that note, I have literally only, I think I've only really have sex in the mornings, right? So that's, that's the way it that's goes awesome. in my family, right? Well, that's, however, I like that because that's where I, I find it. But I, I find my wife, my right. wife is someone who doesn't wake up in the morning and I bother her in the morning. I'm like the, I'm like sort of like honey. And she's like, I'm sleeping <laughs> you know, and I'm sleeping, you know, kind of thing. And I have to kind of, you know, and obviously the foreplay, the whatever, you know, right. it goes on and it's, maybe that's a good thing because it's sort of a part of the stroking and the cuddling and all the rest of it until right. she's awake enough to get going. But it's not necessarily, I think with her, she and she's told me she's like I got I went into the bed at, you know I, and you were asleep, you were asleep and yep. I'm like I'm like well of course I was asleep it was like midnight or something I'm like it was eleven o'clock night we'd had a drink I, I went to bed I was sleeping right. you know I went to bed and I woke up in the morning and I, you know and she's like she's like well you know so that's why I was curious because I mean so let me I would say historically yep. we have only really had sex in the morning you know maybe there's been the odd time here and there the party or the trip or whatever. Yeah. But generally speaking, I'm a morning sex person. And that would make the most sense simply because that's when your hormone levels are going to be at the right place at the right time. Now, right. the good news here is your wife is um, a night owl. So you have two different options. One is you could try something earlier in the evening. So like at 6.30, 7 o'clock, if you happen to get home by that time, right? Now, I get it. You've got kids. And so you may have to, <laughs> may have to be a little sneaky uh, at times to do that. or she could stay up and you could wake up early, right? So as an example, if she's an extreme night owl, maybe she wants to have sex at three o'clock in the morning when she comes to bed. Here's the most interesting statistic that we learned from the entire study is when we were asking women about their chronotype, they would be very specific about the times when they felt most interested in having sex. When we talked to the men, they said, whenever it's offered, I'm ready to go. That's no lie, people. You know, you can wait. This is real data. Know. Like, I'm not making this shit up, bro. Like, we asked this. <laughs> Every guy out there is nodding their head. They're like, really? Just tell me when. I'll sign me up. I'm, I'm ready to go. No, exactly. I know. I know. But hey, but the know, the know that there is a good time. There is. Like we I created said, a matrix, actually, Nigel, in the book. So people can plug in their chronotype on one side and their partners on the other. We also created um, matrices for homosexual couples and lesbian couples because the hormone profiles are different. There you go. Look, you know what? I can talk about this all night and all day, uh, <laughs> but, but I, you know, but I'm going to lose my sleep over it. I think is the problem. There um, you go. 
before we get there, I, I, before we end this, and I thanks so much for being so generous. And there's so much, you're a wealth of information. Guys, not just is Energize a great book, but The Power of When. I, I really, I, I can't tell you, I, this is a really a great book. I'm loving Energize and I'm getting into it and I'm rereading, I've, I'm about halfway through. The Power of When is something that I go back to all the time. Oh, it makes my heart feel good, bro. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I listen, because of you that I gave up coffee. That's, it was you, it was you and me, our last talk, that was when I stopped and it's been six months. So that, wow. that's, it was, you really made me do a massive change in my lifestyle. Well, that's awesome. That makes me, I love it when I have the, that effect on people. You make me feel good. Thank you so much. No, a hundred percent. Look, the, everyone out there, this is our lives. We are responsible for taking, making, making it what it is and for making change and, and taking control of it. You can't be upset with the way you're living unless you actually own it. So own it, make some decisions, make some changes and, 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 you know, feel good about yourself and don't make excuses, but actually, you know, there is no change unless there's change, which, you know, one of my good friends is one of his fa favorite quotes. Look, before we get, let you go, we have something on the show called last orders, which yes. is a fun few questions where we kind of get into, in, into the Dr. Bruce a little bit more, but sure. Dr. Bruce, if you could drink any cocktail from any movie or television show, with that character, what would it be? In other words, an old fashioned with Don Draper or whatever it might be. Is there some movie out there that you that mm. you've loved? Is there somebody you'd love to have a cocktail with? And what would it be? You know, I, I it keeps popping in my head and I'm sure you get the same answer all the time, but it would be a uh, shaken, not stirred martini with uh, Sean Connery. That would be it for me. <laughs> you know what? Wouldn't that be amazing? Right? That would be, that would be amazing. And yeah, I've met Sean Connery. And we've and I've done it. I did an event with him, you know, several years ago. And just what a legend he was, you know, such yeah. an extraordinary character. What those movies are, you know, put cocktails pretty much on the map. And right. uh, hence the name of my show, although we like to do a bit of both over here. So if you in the movie of your life, who would you like to have play you? Hmm. The first person that comes to mind is Brad Pitt. <laughs> of course he does. That's absolutely. I mean, I just want to look like Brad Pitt. So maybe that's why I chose him. The I other one Brad is, Pitt doesn't sleep very well. Oh, prob well, I don't know. If I was him, I'd sleep really well. Um, the other one I was thinking of is the guy from Grey's Anatomy who drives the Porsches, uh, Patrick Dempsey. You know, that's that, I can see that it's slightly better fit, but hey, go for it. Brad Pitt all the way. Right. I mean, come on. I, I would just go with Brad Pitt. Let's leave it okay, at that. Fair enough. Let's let's just go with Brad Pitt. Fantasy that. dinner party. You can invite four guests. I'm going to give you four guests of yep. your choice. Who would they be? Can't be me. Can't be any, any of your wife or any of that kind of stuff. Yep. Dead or alive. Yep. Four guests. Nelson Mandela, JFK, Gandhi. No question. Oh, Freud, Freud. And Freud. Wow. That, now that's a serious dinner. Oh, yeah. We're going to okay. talk about sleep because all of them have very interesting perspective. Like Freud was all about dreams. Mandela, I wanted to know how could you sleep when you were in jail for so long? Um, uh, who was the other one? Uh, JFK. I'd love to know about sleep during the presidency. Every uh, president that I've ever had the opportunity to speak to talks about massive, massive sleep deprivation. I'd love to know what it was like yeah. back then. So those, those are the people I, I would want to have a dinner with for sure. No, for sure. That's actually really fascinating. And I love the, 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 the thought behind it. That's brilliant. And uh, go to oh, drinking and, song. Oh, go ahead. And the last one with Gandhi, because of his ability to meditate, there was some suggestion that he didn't require a lot of sleep because of his ability to meditate and, and, and be so deep about it. So I was very curious about that as well. I love that about Gandhi, by the way. And I've used that myself. I'm someone who doesn't need much sleep. For some odd reason, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a good five hour a night person and I'm, well, well, you know, I'm off to the races and my yeah. wife often complains about it. And I'm like, well, you know, Gandhi only used to sleep around four or five hours a night. Exactly. And I, and she's like, no, you're not Gandhi, darling. <laughs> um, but, hey. but meanwhile, go clean the toilets because apparently that's hey, what Gandhi did. So You are not yeah. Gandhi, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember that I might be a Shrankin, but I'm not Gandhi. Um, go to drinking song. Oh, 99 bottles of beer. <laughs> Bullshit. But anyway, I like that. <laughs> That's like the worst song ever. Is it there is not the worst a song, song you ever. put on? You tell me you like the uh, Beastie Boys. Is there no <laughs> music that you listen to when you get when you're having a drink at night when you're having your man? Oh, oh, when I'm having. Oh, I thought you meant like while I'm like 
drunk with a bunch of friends. Because well, it could be, but you really go to 99 bottles of beer? I, I don't believe that for a moment. High school friends, man. Come on, I'm still friends with my high school bros. Um, what do I like to listen to when I drink? Honestly, um, I like, um, I'm kind of more of a Southern rock and roll. So oh, like yeah. ACDC, um, that whole kind of Leonard Skinner, uh, yeah. Alabama. I like uh, fast country music. Um, and I also like uh, 80s rock. So I'm one of those old school, you know, grew up in the 80s kind of guys. Uh, and to be really fair, if you only allow me one music to listen to, it's probably The Grateful Dead. Wow. I was going to say, you're basically my wife. That's so <laughs> weird. So my wife's favorite band is The Grateful Dead. She's from Alabama, so loves oh. the you know, and loves Alabama. And, and she's, you know, and that, that's basically going to concerts with her was going to The Dead. And we went to the penultimate Dead concert. You know, before Andy Garcia, died. I mean, you know, Jerry, died. Yeah. Jerry Garcia, sorry, died. And, you know, anyway, it was just, uh, you know, wow. I've never been a Grateful Dead person. So I, I grew up in England listening to 80s pop. Yeah, I loved 80s pop. Are you kidding me? Some of the best stuff out there. Yeah. So I've been, I've been learning ever since. I'm still learning. As you can see, I don't even remember the guy's name. But anyway, um, final question yep. shaken or stirred? It's got to be stirred. And why? Because I don't shake things up like that. I'm kind of more of the smooth operator. I kind of just wander around and slowly mix things up. I'm not a kind of guy. And I, I thought it was all about waking up and shaking. But anyway, here we go. Dr. <laughs> Bruce, The Power of When, his new book, Energize. Check him out. They're fantastic. You will do yourself a favor by doing so. Take his quiz online. And what is the name of the quiz again? chronoquiz.com you will learn a whole bunch or go to myenergyquiz.com dr michael bruce the sleep doctor thank you very much on the shaken and stirred show guys we appreciate you listening um have a cocktail on me we'll see you next week thanks so much dr michael bruce we appreciate you all the best cheers cheers to you nigel sweet dreams to everyone and uh try out that banana tea i think you're gonna love it sweet dreams Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. This podcast was produced and edited by Embassy Road.